All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, as, I, as I told you yesterday already, we're going to start today and spend one day with quantification. Yesterday was all qualitative. Today it's going to be about quantitation. Um, I will briefly talk about label-free quantitative proteomics and introduce a few concepts that are related to analytical chemistry um, and then talk about algorithms. And in the afternoon, I will do a brief lecture on how you do the same thing with metabolo met metabolites. And we will see that there are indeed some similarities. So the first thing I would like to talk about, because it's, it's sort of fundamental, it's, it's also rather straightforward, but most people don't realize how deeply if it affects how we analyze our data. That is, what can we actually quantify with mass spectrometry, and how is it done, and how should it be done properly? Um, and part of that is the quantitative behavior of mass spectrometers. What do they really do? What can we extract from that? Then we will talk a bit about quantification strategies. Um, there are over a hundred different strategies on how to quantify stuff using mass spectrometers. And I think you can come up with hundreds of other ideas. Um, you might know that initially quantification was mostly driven by labeling techniques. We will briefly talk about that and, and why that might be a good idea, why it might not be a good idea. Um, but I, what I will focus on for the application and also for the tutorial is going to be label-free quantification. So we will talk a bit about the concepts, about the terms that I'm going to use, because there are some, uh, there are different different ways the terms are used in the literature, and I want to make you aware of that. And then we will talk about three key steps in the analysis, and that is feature finding or feature detection, map alignment, and normalization. So what we're talking about here really, or should be talking about here, really is analytical chemistry. And analytical chemistry deals, as one part of it, with the identification of stuff that you want to know. If you have an exploded pharmacy, you want to know what was in there in the first place. But more, more often, what you want to know is how much of it is there. And that can be arbitrary. That can be in the environment, um, if you want to detect pollutants. But in our case, of course, it is peptides, proteins that we want to detect in a biological sample. Um, there are few terms that are perhaps not all that clear to non-chemists, but uh, they should be defined, which is why I'm going to do it very briefly. When we're talking about the analyte or analytes, then that is what we want to measure. The sample does not only contain the analyte, it also contains lots of other stuff. And that is what we usually call the matrix components of the sample that are not analyzed. And that is an important distinction, because this matrix can massively impact what we see of the analyte. You can imagine if you have one peptide and it's just dissolved in distilled water, it is easier to find and also to quantify that analyte than if you have the same peptide hidden in serum. Um, so there are effects um, on all levels, chemical, um, but also with respect to the signal intensities, to the complexity of the sample, that make it harder to find the analyte. The more complex your matrix, the harder it is to find what you really want to see. It's the difference between the needle lying in the middle of the table and the needle in the haystack. So what do we usually have in there? So let's assume you want to do prote uh, urine proteomics. Then there are, of course, the proteins and the peptides in there that you want to find. But you have also water, you have metabolites, you've got urea, you've got lots of other things that you not, do not care for. Now, you can get rid of part of this matrix as part of free analytical sample treatment. But you can also do that later on if your if your instrumentation has enough um, discrimination power. If we say we want to quantify an analyte, then what we really want to figure out is a concentration. Uh, very rarely are we asking the question, how much is really in, in a whole liter of that whole thing. Um, mostly, we, we inject the fixed, or we have a fixed volume of our sample, and we're asking, what is the molar concentration or the mass concentration? If you know what you're looking for, 
can, of course, convert one into the other. Uh, in one uh, case, it's just the molar amount divided by the volume. In the other, it's the mass divided by the volume. And that is what you want to determine. Now, if you do a measurement, then one thing that uh, one needs to keep in mind that each of these measurements comes with an error. And there are different types of errors. And, and in, in analytical chemistry, um, there are two terms that are sometimes confused, but shouldn't be confused, and that is precision and accuracy. Um, it's an important distinction. You can have very good accuracy with poor precision. I try to indicate that here with these, uh, these dots here. If, if, you, if you basically hit the center of your target, but you have a reasonable variance, then you can actually repeat the measurement over and over, and you get a more, more precise idea of how much of the analyte is there. But what you can also have, uh, but the individual measurement will, the individual measurements will actually differ. What you can also have is a case like this, where you have a good precision. So you repeat the measurement, you get basically the same value all the time, but it's far off the true value. So you have a bias, uh, and these two things need to be. Um, kept apart. The accuracy is how far are you on average from your reference value, from your true value, and the precision is sort of the spread of that distribution when you measure and remeasure that. And obviously what you want to achieve in, in a measurement is uh, a good precision and a good accuracy at the same time. In statistics we would call these two types of errors something else. We would call them a random error when we're talking about the precision. And we would talk about a systematic error, about the bias, if we are talking about the accuracy. And that is just to give you some idea of how these concepts can be mapped between different communities. So how does one typically quantify if, if you're if you don't do omics, if you want to quantify the concentration of a peptide, say you do that in pharmaceutical industry, then what you would usually do is a calibration curve. Yeah, you, you find an analytical method that allows you to quantify the analyte, could be HPLC, doesn't have to be MS, yeah, but it can also be MS. You have a reference substance, you put in known concentrations of that, and you record some detector response. And typically, not with all the detectors, but with most detectors, and including mass spectrometry, we'll get something like this. You will get a linear response that often goes into some sort of saturation. Now, the interesting part of this curves, of this curve is actually the interesting part is here in the middle. That's the linear range because the response of your detector is proportional to the concentration in this range. If you go further up, it becomes nonlinear because you run into saturation, for example, because you cannot pack more ions into your mass spec. That is one of these effects. You will also have noise in your measurement. And you cannot reliably quantify as soon as your signal falls below a certain threshold, this noise threshold. There are basically two thresholds that are interesting. One is the LOD, the level of detection, at what level can you really decide the analyte is present with a certain statistical significance. Now, the LOD without the significance is not meaningful. Note that if you can see that it's there, it doesn't mean that you can quantify it reliably. Uh, oftentimes you need a bit more. You need to be above, reasonably far above the noise level in order to quantify your analyte. So basically, if in, in the range between this limit of or level of, of, quantifica of quantification and the limit of linearity here, this is where you can do a meaningful measurement. And if you do that for an individual analyte, you can of course determine these quantities. That's what you do as an analytical chemistry, a chemist um, if you want to validate a method. You determine that for each compound, for each analyte individually. You can imagine that it's easy if you do that for one. If you do method development for one peptide, that is that's fine, it takes you two days, then you're done with that. But you cannot do that for 100,000 metabolites where you even don't even have the reference substance and you cannot do it for uh, 200,000 peptides that you haven't 
reference substances for it. Um, the limit of detection um, and the limit of quantification um, need to be distinguished. And you can think of that as the lowest analyte concentration that can be distinguished from the absence of the analyte. So basically, when you look at when you look at your chromatogram, when you look at the extracted iron chromatogram, and you see there is a peak there, then you can say I'm above the limit of detection. But the error bars for your quantification at this level will be very, very high. You will probably have something like 200, 300 um, percent error in the quantification. That is why usually you say the limit of quantification is a bit higher, a factor two or three higher than the limit of detection. Fundamentally, you can imagine it like this. When you're, when you're standing at an airport and there's a plane taking off and you're talking to someone, if you're far, far enough away, you cannot really say, figure out whether they're saying anything because you cannot hear it. It's far below the noise level. If you get closer to the person, you can figure out, yeah, that guy is talking, but you cannot still say what he's talking about. And only if you're close enough, if you're at the lev above the level of quantification, you can really figure out what that guy is talking about. Yeah? So these two limits are um, context dependent. Again, they depend on the noise level, on the local noise level. And that is something to keep in mind. What is an influence um, that drives this noise level? Well, that is, for example, the matrix. Uh, if you have a complex matrix, then it becomes harder to do these things. Now, let's talk a bit about doing this with mass spectrometry. So, if you want to quantify an analyte with a mass spectrometer, we are doing quite a few things to our analytes that are essential. Um, the first thing that happens is these analytes run off the HPLC column. If you do HPLC MS, they are being ionized. And that is already when you lose some of your analyte because the majority of whatever you spray out, uh, out of, your, of your cone is not going to end up in the mass spec in the first place. So that's a problem. We could argue, well, once you know how much of that goes through, it's always going to be 1% or whatever. You can figure that out, and that is true. The second problem is that not everything that comes out of this uh, nozzle here is actually going to ionize, and that is a much larger problem. The different analytes will ionize with very dif different efficiencies. Then we accelerate them, and we can hope that we don't lose too much while the stuff flies through our mass spec. We can detect that, and eventually our detector will record how much of an analyte is there. The detector is going to give us a signal that usually is in arbitrary units, and we need to relate that back. The detector does not count ions as such, not individual ions. So how can we get back to a concentration? And that is not so obvious. If we do LCMS, then we have to actually go one step back, because what we do is we inject usually a fixed volume into the LC, that is being separated. And the concentration that hits the, the mass spectrometer is going to depend on the time. Now you have these illusion profiles. It goes up and down. I'll get back to that in a minute. So depending on when your analyte eludes, it will have spread out on the column to a different extent. So what you really care about is, is not how high this peak, how high this intensity is going to be at an arbitrary point, but you really want to sum it all up. Yeah, the analyte enters the column and it starts spreading out. You know the theory of, of uh, you know, this theory behind that there are theoretical plates. Uh, it again boils down to some binomial distribution. Um, you can easily do the math. Um, if that stuff eludes later from the column, it's going to be spread out. The maximum height of this peak is going to be lower. Um, but nothing gets lost on the column, or at least you would hope so. And you would hope that everything that enters the column comes out of the column again. So what you, can you do? Well, you just integrate over your signal. So if you want to know the original concentration 
as a function of time, we record a detector signal, i as a function of time for a given analyte i. And that is going to be proportional to the concentration that enters the mass spec at a given time. There's a factor here, and this Fi, that is the sensitivity of the mass spec for this particular analyte. And that sums up how well this analyte is going to ionize, how well it's going to fly. The mass spectrometer is going to be different, has going to have different sensitivities for different analytes. And this factor F, as we will see later on, is, is, is a bit of a bummer because we have no clue what F really is. Usually you can determine that with the calibration curve. That's basically the slope of your curve if you determine that. But we don't know it for all these analytes. Now the area under the chromatographic peak, that is proportion to the total amount that went into the column. Uh, because what goes into the column has to come out. All you need to do is you need to integrate over this concentration to get the original concentration that entered the column. Now, if, if the intensity is proportional to the concentration at any given time, then this is proportional to the integral over the intensity. Now, let's assume our illusion profile is a Gaussian peak. It also holds for other shapes, but with Gaussian peak, it sort of becomes evident what's going on. Um, we can say this intensity, uh, this concentration that comes off the column and enters the mass spec, that is going to be a Gaussian centered at the elution time of this metabolite with a certain width times the total concentration. Because if you put in 10 times as much of your analyte onto your sample, intensity of this peak is going to be 10 times as high. So if you really want to determine your total concentration, and that is what we are after, that was the concentration in our sample, we can try to integrate this whole thing. And that is the integral over our intensity. If we know that is going to be a Gaussian, then we can clearly see that this integral here becomes 1. And what we get is actually the total concentration of our sample is F times the integral over all the signal. It's kind of trivial when you think about it, but it tells you that you cannot do absolute quantification because this factor F is unknown. So from one measurement, you cannot do absolute quantification. The only way to do that is have multiple measurements and calibrate that, determine this factor f, or um, the easy way, easy way out is not do absolute quantification at all, and just as you do with Brent's atomics as well, you do relative quantification. So you say, I don't care how much is in one sample, all I need to know is what's the ratio between two samples, between control and diseased. Because then you divide these intensities in one group of samples by the intensities in the other group of samples, and this F magically disappears. And that's all that's behind relative and absolute quantification. It's fairly straightforward. Now, let's get back to proteomics. Um, so most peptides and proteins are usually identified, but not quantified. And that has to do with the sensitivity that we have reached these days. Um, identification via tandem MS, you can do rather quickly. Um, and many things can be seen, detected. But as I said, the level of quantification is higher than the level of detection. So you see there's something there, but you cannot quantify it. So usually, we have a, a smaller proportion of whatever is there that can be reliably quantified. This metabolomics things are a bit different because there we have an issue with the identification. Identification is easier in proteomics. You had a question? So, but uh, in the sense of uh, the human system, the human population, the size of protein. Yes. For, uh, oh, I, That's, an, that's a great question, and the answer is you can't. 
The answer is you can't. That is something that is often overlooked without further, there are a few tricks to do that, but, but, with, but you cannot compare the intensity of one peptide to the intensity of another peptide and make a statement and there's more of this than of that. That is not possible unless you determine these factors. Yeah. So just by looking, uh, it's actually an excellent observation. <laughs> um, you cannot say that. You can compare you can compare the same peptide between different samples. That's easy because it's going to be the same F, the same analyte. But you cannot compare different peptides, not even in the same sample. Yeah. Well, you can correlate them. Yeah. statement there is more of protein A in the sample than protein B. You need to have absolute same. Now how is you how do you usually quantify? So when proteomics started the first techniques were labeled techniques and labeling um, in this context usually means labeling with sti uh, stable isotopes. Um, if you're doing mass spec, then obviously choosing something that modifies the mass while maintaining the chemistry is, in, is, is a good way to go. And that is what stable isotope labeling does. You introduce stable isotopes of, of, a, of, a, of an element, you enrich these naturally rare isotopes, like you can use deuterium, 13C, 15N, 18O, uh, any of these, uh, of, of these isotopes really work. It's a matter of effort. Also, uh, this whole, whole stuff is not exactly cheap. You have to synthesize that in an isotopically enriched manner. And you can do different scheme, schemes for, for labeling. You can either introduce label in one sample and a different or no label in the other, and then you can easily compare them. Um, and by choosing labels that are that differ only in their mass, they will still be chemically more or less identical. They will basically come at the same retention time on your chromatographic color because it's still the same thing. This slight mass shift doesn't have a huge influence. It's it's measurable, but it's it's not huge. You might know that heavy water, for example, still behaves mostly like water. It doesn't boil at 100 degrees Celsius, it boils at 105, but otherwise it behaves like water. It looks like water, smells like water. I never tasted it, but I suppose it tastes like water. Um, the disadvantages are, of course, that these labels are expensive. They can be difficult and, and they, can be, uh, they can introduce additional errors when you introduce them into the samples. The, the less you do with your sample, um, the less errors you introduce. Another problem is that labeling is not always possible in vivo. So if you're doing clinical proteomics, then certain ways of getting these labels into your sample are impossible. You might know SILAC, or where you grow a cell culture. That is easy if you do that with a cell culture. It's harder if you do it with mice. Um, it has been done. You can do mice, but um, it's expensive to do to a SILAC mouse. Um, I think I heard a number of 75,000 at some point. That's what you need to label a whole mouse. Um, you can also imagine that labeling a patient would be something that is rather not done. And that is not even mentioning the cost for that. So there are limits to that. Fundamentally, there are two different types of, of labelings uh, or different ways of introducing labels. One is chemical labeling where you modify the peptides chemically after extraction. And that also can be done with clinical samples, obviously. And the other is metabolic labeling. Um, and Sidak is an example of that, where you basically feed the organism 
with something that is isotope labeled and hope that the whole metabolism is sort of integrated into the, into the um, proteins or metabolites. A different way is label-free quantification, and it's sort of the most natural way to go about. You just say, I, I don't need labels. Why have people used labels anyhow? What's the big advantage of using labels? Well, I would argue you can also quantify accurately using label free quantification. So, what does it mean? What's the advantage of multiplexing? You can basically acquire a quantity. Of quantifying multiple samples at the same time in one run and in this way save instrument time. Uh, note that this doesn't come for free. Um, you have always to consider the dynamic range of your measurement. Um, so by adding 10 samples into one run, you do not necessarily get a more accurate quantification, you just save runtime. Um, but initially, labels were also used because you could just look at one spectrum in SILEC and manually compare the intensities. So the manual analysis was actually the main driving force for these labeling techniques. You didn't have to try and, and find these peaks and know who, which peak corresponds to which other peak. If you see a SILEC spectrum, you have peak groups that are shifted by a known distance and you can easily integrate over those two peak groups manually and figure out what the relative intensity is. And that was the main driving force. But um, now um, people realize that these things do not scale all that well. When we are doing clinical proteomics and you're do doing thousands of samples, then the labeling itself becomes a major issue. A cost issue, um, but also a matter of um, um, and, uh, automating this. So this here is a nice overview figure that, that shows how you can think of this in terms of sample preparation. So with metabolic labeling, you would have two, say, two mice or two cell cultures, and you would label them differently. And these stable isotopes are integrated at this first stage already, and then you can mix the two samples, purify them, fractionate them, extract the proteins, digest them, and in the MS data, you will then have peak groups that are distinct only by this mass shift of the, of the label you introduced. Which means that no matter what arrows you introduce in these later steps, they will be sort of captured because you treat both samples at the same time in the same way. So for the relative quantification between your sample groups, there will be no impact no matter how much you lose during purification or, or subsequent fractionation. And that is another key advantage of these labeling techniques, because you keep the things that belong together, you keep them together. Um, chemical labeling introduces these labels a bit later. After extraction, there are different ways to do that. You can do that on protein level. You can do that on peptide level. You can also spike in peptides. That is a way to also do quanti absolute quantification. You just add a peptide that you care about, but you see here the scaling comes from the number of peptides that you can add to that. Buying 50,000 peptides might not be the cheapest way to do quantification in proteomics. Um, or you can do label-free, and here you basically skip all that. You just say, I measure my samples. I don't do any labeling. I merge them later on. And I do the comparison only during data analysis. And you can easily see that that, has, that implies other issues, because you run into issue, issues of normalization and comparability of these samples. So if we do quantitative proteomics, then there are a few terms that I, I would like to define. Um, what our mass spec really measures are only spectra. MS spectra, tandem spectra. And you can think of label-free data as just a stack of spectra that are being recorded and are re being recorded um, as a function of retention time. Yeah, so the mass spec just measures one spectrum after the other, 10 per second or something like that. 
while you analyze run of the column. So you can think of that as a two-dimensional data set, and you've seen that in the viewer yesterday already. Um, this here is basically the view from top on such a data set. You see the M over Z along this axis, the retention time along this axis, and if you can look at the same thing in, in 3D, you can also do that in top view as you've seen, you see the illusion profile. So stuff comes off the column, intensity goes up, intensity, go, intensity goes down at the end of that peak, illusion peak. So when you look at such a data set, if we want to do quantification, what we really care about is we want to find that these peaks here are from the same analyte. And according to this integral that I showed you, what you really need to do is you need to sum up all the signal that comes from the same analyte. And you need to distinguish it from the signal that comes from other analytes. So you want to, uh, to figure out that these peaks belong together and you want to assign a number to them. Either an absolute quantification, like 50 nanomoles per microliter, or a relative number, like three times overexpressed in comparison to another sample. And that's all, that's all we care about in label-free quantification. In order to do that, there are different steps. So the whole data set, this 2D data set, is what we call a map. And the signal that comes from one distinct analyte in a distinct charge state is what we call a feature. So if we want to compare different samples, the first step that we usually do is we do feature finding. We try to find all the features in one map. So assume we got three samples. That's what I'm going to do in this example. Three different samples, this, this gray, green, and, and red. Um, then in a the first step, we would like to reduce them to something manageable. We would like to have like only dots here that represent a certain retention time, a certain mass to charge ratio, and, and stand for the peptides that were in these three samples. Now, if these three samples are reasonably similar, they're all yeast samples or all human samples, then you should be able to identify that certain features in this map correspond to certain features in this map. And that is an alignment step. You have to figure out, because retention time is not all that stable, or not as stable as mass usually is, these things drift a bit in retention time. You have to correct for that. You have to figure out that this guy here really is the same as, as this guy. And you have to shift them a bit in order to, to overlap these maps. I'll show you the algorithm for that later on. Once you've done that, you can link the corresponding features. You can really figure out that this guy here is the same as this guy is the same as this guy. You can identify that, and you can quantify that. And you can figure out that this is a certain peptide, and it occurs at twice the concentration in the first two samples than it does in the third sample. And that is typically the result of a label-free quantification. You get a list of peptides, and you get numbers that tell you relative intensities in the various maps. Yes? So it helps you to get the number of peptides in the same So how, how sure we are that they are? Well, there's no straightforward answer to the question. I mean, this is a valid concern. You can do different things. So, as usually, it's a matter of statistics. So you will be you will be wrong occasionally, but you will be right most of the time if you do it the whole thing right. What you can do is you can, of course, identify, for example, through the tandem mass spectra, each of these features. And then you can apply different strategies, because already the identification comes with an error. We've seen that yesterday. We, you have a false discovery rate. So if you identify the same peptide across a 1,000 samples, if you have an FDR rate of, say, 5%, then 5% of these identifications will actually give you different peptides. So there are two things you can do. You can say, oh, I'm not sure about this guy. Just get rid of him. Or you could say, well, I see 95% of the cases this guy is identified as peptide X. That's what I'm going to believe. You only see it in one sample. 
then you know it's it's probably present in one sample and zero in the others. So that is fairly straightforward. Even though it is actually quite hard to reliably exclude that something is present in the sample, but more for fundamental philosophical reasons than anything else. Yeah, because you can the only thing you can really say is it is below the level of detection. But that is typically taken for it's not there. So this whole process is really a data reduction type of workflow because you start um, with your raw data and you filter that through different data reduction steps down to something that becomes manageable. These features are several orders of magnitude smaller than what you have in this raw feed list. You annotate that with identifications. Um, and in the end, what really comes out in a label-free quantification is a list of differentially expressed proteins or peptides, depending on how far you push that. Um, and that is usually on a different order of size. Um, you often start with 10 gigabytes of raw data. And in the end, you have one kilobyte of, of uh, that is an Excel sheet that contains only the stuff that you really care about. Uh, so what we try to do as, as part of this pipeline is really boil down this data to what we care about, what, we, what is really essential for, uh, for biology there. So let's look at these different algorithmic steps. So the first step is feature finding. And the idea here is to identify all the peaks in all the spectra across retention time and M over Z that belong to the same peptide. Now, how can we recognize them? If you look at that, or if you look at the image I've shown you before, then if you have some experience with mass spec, you can immediately say, well, these guys here, those belong together, and those guys belong together, and there's something here and there. We can easily pick up the pattern. But how does the, the algorithm really recognize the pattern? Now, if you want to recognize a pattern, you need to know what you're looking for. And when we're looking for a feature, we need to understand how the feature actually comes about. So what you can do is you can design a model of the two separation processes, the LCMS separation and the, the mass spectrometric separation. And you can try to find this model in your data. It's as simple as that. Now, if you replace then your data with this model, then you have a pretty accurate estimate of this integral. And that gives you a pretty good estimate of their quantification. Now, what are the attributes of such a feature? It's basically the position. And that is m over z, so where is the monoisotopic peak, and retention time. When does it come off the column? That is essential for the matching of the features and for the assignment of the identity. For the quantification, we care about the intensity or, to be precise, the volume, because it's going to be the integral over this two-dimensional model. If you have a parameterized model, this integral can be computed easily. Or, to estimate it, you can also sum over all the peaks that, are, that drive or support this model. This, the third thing you want to know is the quality. Does that really look like a peak? What is the shape of that? How well does that fit? Because that might be uh, a factor for downstream analysis, how much you trust your quantification, how much you trust your identification as well. So let's look at this model. Uh, I said already it's, it's basically two independent separation processes, LC and MS. And if they're independent, then our model is kind of easy. We need to know what it looks like on the m over z dimension. And we established already that that is a binomial distribution. We know what it should look like in the retention time dimension. In an ideal case, that is a Gaussian. Um, but again, you can also use arbitrary other peak shapes. There are hundreds of different mathematical descriptions of peaks. Um, you can pick any of them. The whole statement still holds, but you usually uh, Gaussian usually goes goes a long way. And we just multiply the two, and that gives us a good model of our feature. And here you see the two-dimensional shape of something like that. Note that this is a low-resolution 
shape, as you go to high resolution instruments, these peaks, of course, separate and become baseline separated. So such a feature model needs to represent um, both physical processes to determine the shape and with chromatography, we can just assume a Gaussian that has three parameters, the width, the height, and the position. With mass spectrometry, we um, said yesterday that this is a binomial distribution based on the composition, but the problem here is that we don't know what that peptide is. So we don't know the comp composition. And the solution to that is what's called the average gene model. Um, the average gene is not an existing chemical compound, um, but the average gene is an average peptide. So what you can do is you can take all of SwissProt, and it's, it's, it's a simple exercise, it's a small Python script that you can do. You download the FASTA file of SwissProt, you look at the composition of the amino acids and you compute the average amino acid. And your average amino acid has 4.94 carbon atoms and 7.76 hydrogen atoms and so on. Of course, this is not a structure, but it gives you a good idea of how many carbons, how many hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens to expect for a peptide of a certain mass. Now the mass we do know because we know where this guy is. Uh, if you're looking in a certain region, you, of course, know this is going to be about 1,000 Dalton. Now, if you know it's 1,000 Dalton, you can just divide by the average mass of one of these amino acids and you figure out how many carbons are going to be there in a peptide of 1,000 Dalton. And while this is not obviously not ac very accurate, it's a very good estimate, and you would be surprised how chemically homogeneous amino acids really are on this level. So this average gene model is something that can be used to estimate this distribution at certain masses, and I showed, showed this slide yesterday already. Based on that, you can say light peptides will have higher monoisotopic peaks, and heavier peptides will shift towards this normal distribution, and by this you can also recognize what you're dealing with. So we have a pretty decent model of, of the M over Z once we know the, the rough mass, so that's fairly easy. And the second ingredient we need is we need to have some idea of the resolution of your instrument, because if you have higher charge states, um, you can easily see that these peaks go closer together and you might lose the baseline separation of your uh, peaks in the mass spectrum. With illusion profiles, we just start with a Gaussian. Um, you can also, and you can change that in the model, you can also use models like exponentially modified Gaussians, EMG. Um, these models have asymmetric peak, peak shapes that you frequently observe in chromatography, and they're better suited to describe these illusion patterns that you observe in a non-ideal separation. So, Having this model, we can try to put that all together, and I will not go into the details of this algorithm uh, too deeply. Um, it basically tries to enumerate all possible hypotheses for explaining the signal, and then tries to fit them against the signal it sees, and figures out which of these possible explanations of the signal is true. So we start by collecting so-called mass traces, so let me try to explain this figure. So again, we have m over z on the x-axis, our, our key retention time on the y-axis, and these crosses here represent peaks. Intensity doesn't really play a role here. So what we see is a peptide coming off the column, retention time goes up, and then it disappears again. We have a monoisotopic here, plus one, plus two. So question, why do we have fewer crosses here? at plus one and plus two than we have on the monoisotopic. Yes, the intensity is low and these guys drop into the noise sooner. Uh, so we will not see them in as many spectra. It's, so you have this typical triangle shape that you can also see when you visualize this. Um, and you basically want to figure out that in adjacent spectra you have peaks at more or less the same position. And that is what we call a mass trace. So we collect these mass traces and we know where to look because if we know that this guy here is a monoisotopic guy, then the others should have lower intensity, so you can stop searching for them 
um, in the boundaries defined by this first mass trace. Now the question is, um, can we put that together? And that is the problem of feature deconvolution because these features can overlap. And again, we are at the problem of the matrix. If you are, have a sample that is sufficiently complex, then you will see lots of overlap. Um, if you have a very sparse sample, only hundreds of peptides, then things become fairly easy. This won't happen. So what we try to do is we try to fit different explanations for the patterns and pull out the stuff we have explained and try to explain the rest away, um, step by step, in iterative fashion. So how can features overlap? So the e easiest thing that can happen is uh, is this first case here, interleaved features. So you have mass traces where one of the features is pushed between mass traces of another feature. That is easy to resolve as long as your mass accuracy is high enough to separate these guys. If that is not the case, it actually turns into the second type of overlaps. Here you have mass traces that cannot be separated, but you will see that they should, if that they're separated in the retention time. And in this case, you figure out, well, this is a mass trace, but when I look at the illusion profile, I see it's actually two peaks. You just split these two peaks in a post-processing step. The third case is you have co-eluting peptides that are shifted by a mass offset that is accidentally or by design hitting a higher uh, isotope trace. Um, and these are kind of tricky because you will lose one of these mass traces. But given the fact that the intensities of these plus two plus three traces are rather low, the error that is induced by this type of overlap in the quantification is also rather low. All right. Um, what we do then in the algorithm is we, we test these different hypotheses, different overlaps. We test different charge states as well. You also have to model things like the amount of sulfur in, in these peptides, all that goes into these models. You test them and you determine something like a fit. You basically ask the question, how well does this model explain the data that you see peak by peak? And you can do that with a simple correlation-based model. You basically multiply your, your data um, um, and the model and you figure out how well the degrees, and that all already gives you a quality, a simple quality measure for your feature. Now, while this algorithm works reasonably well, um, there are issues that you cannot resolve easily. Now let's look at this case here. We have four mass traces, and you could obviously say this is feature where we have monoisotopic plus one plus two plus three. But if you look closely, you will see that this guy here is actually higher than the plus one. So what's going on? Yes. What else could that be? Could also be a sulfur-containing peptide. Yeah, because sulfur has a shift of plus two. Uh, in this case, actually, it was a labeling um, that had a mass shift of two. So your first guess was right. Um, but you cannot easily distinguish these things. And that is something to keep in mind. This feature finding will never be perfect. But as with all algorithms, you just have to get it good enough so that it can do the job, because you simply will not be able to manually inspect each of these features. Um, just to give you an idea of the numbers, if you have a thousand samples and you do label-free quantification, then per run you will have on the order of, of 50 to 100,000 features that you could find. And there's no way that you can look at those. The only thing you can do is quality control on selected subsets. In this case, it wouldn't. It would assume this is a sulfur-containing peptide. But you shouldn't run labeled data on, on a label-free feature finder. So it's a bit cheating. No, 
I mean, you can do that, but it's not going to make a huge difference because it's going to test all hypotheses, and if there's no sulfur in there, it's going to decide that the sulfur-free version is going to be better. But without this sulfur testing, it, it can actually run into issues here. Okay. Okay. So, what are the the problems with feature finding? So, low resolution instruments might not yield good isotope patterns. That problem is going away. Um, hardly anyone, although I'm always shocked at what instruments are still in operations, but hardly anyone is using old iron trap instruments anymore these days. Um, peptides can overlap. I've showed you that. There are some things that we cannot automatically disentangle, and you need to be aware of that. Um, fitting of such overlapping peptides can then yield bogus results. And that means there needs to be some statistic assessment of what is going on downstream. And if you really want to, if you really want to bring a clinical biomarker forwards based on your proteomics results, then you should not do that based on the individual results of one measurement. Anyhow, yeah, you need an orthogonal uh, method to be to validate that. Um, Low intensity features are hard to distinguish from noise peaks, that's obvious. Um, there are parameters that you can twist and tweak. And what is going to happen if you go down with your noise threshold, your runtime is going to be going to explode and you will find features everywhere. So if you tell the algorithms, try to find everything that you can see, it's going to do that. Uh, it's going to be a good algorithm and pick out all this crap, um, but it not, might not be what you want. And another thing. I just mentioned that isotope labels, um, you need to be aware of, of these things. They can skew these distributions. So there are, there are tricks how you can integrate that. You can basically tell the algorithm that the average gene model is different. And then it can find these things as well. But uh, variable um, incorporation rates of stable isotopes, that is something that cannot be easily done. We actually have a different feature finder for that. Then we need to align these things. That's the second step. Um, LCMS maps contain millions of peaks, and, and there's lots of literature um, on chromatographic alignment of peaks. Most of it is not very helpful, um, because they try to reorder peaks and shift them around. Um, there's a very simple thing that you should keep in mind. Don't try to fix graphic chromatography with bioinformatics. It's not going to work. If you can't get that right, you shouldn't be doing proteomics. Uh, it's as simple as that. That being said, the alignment is essential because you will never get it so perfect that you don't need it. Um, what do we need to do? We, we have two maps, and, and here this, just this excerpt is not the whole map contains about 350 million, uh, 350,000 peaks. If you reduce them to features, then you see suddenly things become a lot easier. So alignment should not be done on the spectrum level. You can do that, but it's, it's so pointless. Instead, if you reduce your data to features, and if the feature, feature alignment, uh, the feature finding step work reasonably well, you have, will have a much easier time aligning these features than aligning peaks. So our strategy is always feature finding first, alignment later. And there, there's a very simple algorithm um, that does just a, a straightforward linear alignment. Now, you might argue there, but there are 250 papers on nonlinear alignment, time warping, that always reduce the error by another 10%. And that is true, and it works. But for most purposes, it is pointless. Because you don't have to get these peaks exactly on top of each other. You just have to get them close enough that there are no other options when you link these peaks. And that is something that is often overlooked. Reducing this error be beyond what's reasonable is not going to improve your quantification results. Fundamentally, what we need to do is the following. We have maps that contain features, map 1, 2, 3. And we're looking for transformations, T1, T2, TK, uh, through TK, that take these positions of the features and transform them to new positions where corresponding features are close enough so that you can pick them up and group them together. 
And the first step is what we call alignment. Second step is what we call linking. There are also are algorithms that do that in one step, and you can, I think we have uh, half a dozen of algorithms for doing that. Uh, but fundamentally, it's reasonably straightforward. If you stick with a transformation that is linear or affine, um, you're basically asking a question, if you're looking just at retention time, find me a transformation of these feature coordinates into a new space and that is a linear function. I will not go into the details of the algorithm. Um, we use something that's called post-clustering, um, which is reasonably fast. It just figures out by under which shift do we find the best signal when we try to compare them. Um, that's blazingly fast and you can do that in a pairwise fashion. You can also go for multiple alignment if you need multiple maps. I don't have the time to talk about that either, but if, if, you, if you're interested in that, just ask me later. Um, and that gives you then unified coordinates for all these features where you can try to link them and figure out what goes where. You can also do nonlinear alignments. We do have that. Um, there are algorithms like um, uh, lowest regression that can be used. You can also do that as a post-processing pro pro uh, uh, step. And when you look at the data, it seems obvious that you should be doing this nonlinear alignment. Uh, this here is retention time deviation plotted as a function of time. And you see this retention time shift between two maps is not linear. But at the same time, this linear function will be sufficient to bring them close enough so that you can really link them. And you can see that the RT error can be reduced by a factor of two using lowest regression. But you're still at an error that is at one, at, at a few seconds. And if you go with this error from 10 seconds to five seconds, it will actually make zero difference in the linking of the features. So if you feel more comfortable with that, you can do that too, but it's up to you. So feature linking is the process that takes features from one map and sort of assigns them to features in another map. You can also do feature linking within the map. That is something we do, for example, for label techniques, silent pairs. There you're looking for features that have a partner feature in a known mass distance. Uh, but it's fundamentally the same idea. You're trying to group stuff either within maps or across maps. And the parameters are pretty evident. You need to have a mass tolerance that you get from the instrument, and you need to have a retention time shift that you allow, and then the whole thing is going to find the optimal assignment of these features. Now in OpenMS and TOP, um, we have two tools that do that map aligner post-clustering and feature linker unlabeled QT. Um, strange names, we will have to change them at some point, but that's, those are the, the algorithms that we recommend for this particular exercise. And they are constructing what we call consensus features. So in the visualization, this is going to look like this. You will see that you have these different dots. These are each small black dots. You see them here as vertical lines. They are the individual features in different maps in unaligned coordinates. And this yellow thing here, you can't see that all that well. That is the centroid, the center of, of the consensus feature. The consensus feature, you can imagine that as a group of features pulled from different maps. And if you zoom in close enough, these look like lines, but really they are stars. Uh, so if you zoom in close enough, you will see that there's also a certain scatter along the mass over charge dimension that is also normally distributed, but of course, the accuracy is much higher in the master charge dimension. And the retention time dimension, they scatter a lot further, but that's basically how we visualize that. And the whole thing, you can also do uh, quality control map statistics, for example. You will usually see something like this. You will see that many of these features will be found only in an individual map. These are features that are present only in one of the samples, or more likely, where close to the level of detection, it could only be detected in one of the samples. And then you will have lots of features that you will find in all the different maps, and you will have anything in between. That also means that if you want to quantify across many samples, you need to have a way for imputing, uh, either imputing or for dealing with missing values, because you will have missing values if you have enough samples. 
Another thing that needs to be kept in mind is normalization. So there are different strategies that are being discussed in literature, you, being used by different groups. You can spike in internal standards or external standards. You can do whatever you like. Um, but actually, um, what works best is taking the whole sample as, as your standard. So in most of the cases, you get a more stable calibration if you assume and that's a biologically meaningful hypothesis that the majority of your proteome will not be changed. I mean, if you still have living cells, then homeostasis will actually make sure that only a fraction, a small fraction of these proteins can be up or down regulated. So basically the idea is you remove everything that changes between these samples and the rest should still be stable and should calibrate these samples against each other. And that works remarkably well. Um, what you can basically do is something like a robust regression. So you try to align the intensities and you discard everything that is regulated between samples and you do that again and in this way you get a stable, pretty stable calibration across samples. Okay, um, I'm almost through. So what this looks like in OpenMS um, is rather simple. This is the simplest workflow that you can do. You have a bunch of input files. Each file stands for one sample that you measured. You make a loop, and for this loop you call the feature finder. This feature finder, in this case feature finder centroid, is going to find these features in the sample. The zip loop end is going to collect all these results for all the samples. And the map aligner post clustering is going to do the map alignment between each of those, and the feature linker is then going to aggregate them. So what comes out at the end of this pipeline is a consensus XML file that contains these consensus features. Note that this does not yet identify uh, your peptides. It's just going to give you a large table that says, I have found a feature at retention time 5 minutes 40 seconds at a mass of 850, and the intensities in the 10 samples are 1, 2.3, 4.5, and so on. And that's very similar to what you would get from transcriptomics. You know, it's basically an expression matrix on the feature level. And here's another uh, word of caution. Um, something that you should not forget is that Peptides can actually have multiple charge states. And a feature is not a peptide. So you have to go from the feature to the peptide to the protein to actually map that back onto the, 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 the entity you care about. You can have two features, charge state plus two plus three for the same peptide, and they will be quantified independently. Something to keep in mind. Have that, but we don't do it in this community. Okay. What do you mean, how about imputation? We, we usually do that in R. So we do the downstream statistics. So we take you to this point. We take you a little bit further <laughs> because we take you to the quantification. There's a protein quantifier that you will see in tools that does some of these things. But if you really want to do thorough statistics, um, then that is something you will do the rest of the week, I think, starting Wednesday, right? Um, so we like to take that to R, and that is where it comes, comes in handy that you can actually embed R scripts into NIME, and that's our favorite way to do that. Because the, the way you do the imputation, the way you aggregate these things will depend on your on your experimental design. Okay, further questions? Yeah. So, uh, in, in, in some of these sample models, I mean, you know, there are a lot of uh, unknown features sitting there which is never going to be changed. Yeah. Why do you include those? Because those can be background, those can be part of the transaction. So, why do you include those in normalized features? You know, because it's more like it, you know, it's, it's kept in your quantification. Why? 
No, why, why would something that I just don't know what it is affect my quantification? No, no. If it is not reliable, you would discard it in the normalization yeah, because it would be unstable across all these samples. But I try not. I, I, I try not to mix up identification and quantification. The two are actually very independent processes, and um, you can bring that together. And of course, you need to do that in the end. But if you don't need to. If you don't need to use the identity of, of a peptide, uh, you shouldn't. And, and for the quantification, also for the normalization, you just don't need to know what it is. Well, the peak height is just not um, the peak height is not what you're looking for, because the peak height will actually depend on the illusion time. The peak area will not. Yeah, that's why I showed this, these integrals. Uh, that is, uh, it's sort of, it's a bit subtle, but the peak height is not proportion to the concentration. If the retention time shifts. Uh, and, and, and of course, I know that you can use the peak height as a substitute for the peak area, but you're, what you really want to have is the integral over the whole signal, and that is peak area. Say again. Well, that depends on your chromatography. Um, but if you if you if you fit if you fit a shape to that, then it doesn't matter. It's one of the advantages of model driven physics. But with feature finding, you should have an idea of how wide your peaks are. Um, we will see that later this afternoon. You need to understand your chromatography. You need to understand what to expect, at least roughly in terms of peak width, and you need to know how accurate your, your mass spec is. Uh, if you know these things, then you can usually twist the parameters of these algorithms in, in a meaningful way. Further questions? I would say let's get started with the label-free workflow and work our way through data. And uh, you just give me a shout if you have further questions. Thank you.